Water brought most of our ancestors to this continent. And water took them westward into it. Water was their road to freedom and sometimes riches, their source of inspiration and adventure. That's also true on a boat named Driftwood for a group of young Americans and Canadians right out of college. Over a three-year period, they covered 25,000 miles along the waterways of North America, from Nova Scotia to the Gulf of Mexico. A professional crew operated the boat while teams of young people documented the journey. Among them, Bill Arnold from Mohawk College in Hamilton, Ontario, Tom Miller, a graduate of the University of Florida, and Moss Kramer from Iowa State University. Travel with them to visit the places and meet the people they discovered along the way. Like the town where bedtime takes on a whole new meaning. The hundred-year-old woman who strikes fear in the hearts of Florida developers. And the doctor whose patients are some of nature's most gentle creatures. Join the crew of the Driftwood as they travel the west coast of Florida and then to its liquid heart, Lake Okeechobee. members of the Driftwood crew, it would be their first visit to Northwest Florida, the Panhandle. From the naval base in Pensacola to the beaches in Panama City, this 100-mile stretch of coastline is known as the Redneck Riviera. But compared to the rest of Florida, it's isolated. Traveling along the Gulf Coast, we came upon uh, a bay, uh, a very special bay, St. Joseph Bay. Port St. Joseph is pretty much a two-industry town, like many places along the Panhandle, commercial fishing is big here. All sorts of seafood. The driftwood hit town during the scallop season. The other main business is paper. There's a mill in Port St. Joe right on the water, and that points to something unusual about the bay. The lower part, which is more developed, is polluted. But tidal currents carry most of the dirty water out to sea, leaving the upper bay pristine. And Dr. Ann Rudlow wants it to stay that way. You can't begin to appreciate how diverse and beautiful life is until you look in the ocean where most things live. There's a little tiny creature right here on my finger now. So you want to come around, you can see it. The first time we met her, she was conducting a field trip with it's, a bunch of kids yeah, in high school who were learning about marine biology life. through her. This little guy is called a mud crab, and it was hiding in that dead shell from the horseshoe crab, and they come out at night, and they just pick through the bottom, and they're kind of scavengers. You know? And a lot of the fish that people go out here when they go fishing on weekend, the fish that they're catching are probably feeding on little crabs like this. So this is also a very important member of the community out here. That's what she's trying to do, is perpetuate her interest in, in marine biology and some of the smaller things, maybe the less romantic things, not the sharks and whales of the sea, but the, the, the crabs and the, and the plankton and the sea life that you have to stop and look at and really appreciate. You see that? See, there's a little hermit crab in there? And there's probably not a better place to do that than in St. Joe Bay. The water is shallow and full of seagrass beds, which are one of the most productive environments in the world. They house literally hundreds of different kinds of animals, some microscopic, some rather ugly, but every last one a potential lifesaver. Okay. Now, most of the drugs we use in human medicine come from natural products, natural plants, natural animals. And people who are now looking for new drugs against cancer and against AIDS are looking very often at marine animals. Snorkeling what is going on is a lot of these are becoming extinct before we even have the potential of discovering or finding out whether or not they do have the potential to cure any of these incurable diseases. 
They're becoming extinct because their habitat is disappearing. The planet's really starting to have all it can take of our pollution, and we're going to have to do something. And I hope we can start right here in St. Joe Bay. This is what it's supposed to look like. This is a system that's operating the way this planet has operated for 600 million years until we came along. It's a shame to see it all dying. That's why, from her home in the tiny coastal town of Panacea, Ann Rudlow has been fighting every development proposal that comes along, she and her husband, Jack. Well, I think where we're really most effective is when it comes to a lot of the environmental battles, because while I can be impassioned about what's there, Ann, is, Ann provides the hard data, the statistics, the hard-hitting facts that so many people need. Oh, here's one. And while Ann has a PhD, Jack never finished college. He's a writer and a self-taught expert on marine life. They met when she was a graduate student in Tallahassee. She was looking for a creature called a sea squirt and had heard about a place in Panacea where she might find one. It was Jack's company, Gulf Specimen, and he was smitten the first time he laid eyes on Ann. It's become a long-standing joke that instead of etchings, he invited her to see his sea squirts. That was 19 years ago. Today, Ann and Jack run the company together. They will get these specimens from the Gulf of Mexico and ship them out to many different laboratories and colleges around the United States for testing or experimentation or just in everyday classwork. Most of the orders that come in are pretty routine. Schools want crabs or sea urchins or jellyfish. But Jack also had to hit the water in search of shark blood and some pretty exotic fish. These trigger fish that are like little piranhas, he holds a hunk of meat down inside the tank, and these things just make this sucking noise and start chewing on the meat. I had a piece of my finger bitten out by one of these pen things. That hurts for weeks afterwards. Like Ann, Jack is no fan of development. He's seen firsthand what it can do. You've got places where he used to go and get his shrimp, he used to go and get his sea urchins, and those places are being destroyed, and he no longer can go there. We create our own monsters. Our monsters, to me, are drag lines, bulldozers, dredges, uh, equipment that uh, can come in and reproduce the dinosaur that gobbles down the real estate and eats the land and slurps up, slurps up the marshes and uh, crushes the trees and grinds them up and that kind of thing. Jack knows a lot of people view him as a fanatic. Many of his neighbors welcome development and the money it will bring, and they question his motives. Everybody says, well, the only reason you're trying to protect the environment is because you make your living out of it, which is kind of interesting because of the minuscule, uh, you know, few shekels that we make out of this thing isn't really significant. What is significant, Jack says, is the preservation of species, because like Anne, he believes that every living creature has a right to survive. It's a value he's trying to pass on to his two sons. On the day the Driftwood crew visited, the Rudlow men took a turtle that had accidentally been caught by a shrimper and returned it to the sea. Here's this animal that's near extinction. There could be, in five years, there could be none of them left. And I got to, I got to see one. People uh, should appreciate that more often. I, I know I do. I do now. The Panhandle, where the Rudlows live, is an area that doesn't fit the image people usually have of Florida. The kind of beaches I'm used to growing up in Miami are, are filled with condos and filled with uh, concrete, and that's what I was raised seeing. And um, you go to a place like this and you say, this is Florida? It's an area that is still uh, undeveloped. It's maybe as Florida was 200 years ago, 300 years ago. The whole shoreline is just covered with shells that aren't crushed, you know, and aren't picked up yet and aren't collected. Um, there are no footprints on the beach. Then you go back a little further, and, and it rises up into these huge sand dunes that are the biggest I've ever seen. 
A little further down the coast, the Driftwood crew found other expanses of land that were just as lovely. One stretch is known as the Big Bend, an area virtually untouched by development. And that's how it will remain, thanks to an unusual partnership involving a corporation, the state, and an organization known as the Nature Conservancy. They don't go in and say, give us your land. You're destroying it. You're going to you're gonna, uh, wreck it for mankind. They go in and they say, listen, you know, they'll walk in with a suit and tie and put their briefcase down on, the, on the, the table and negotiate. And in northwest Florida, the Conservancy's chief negotiator is George Wilson. Part of his job is to travel the state, scouting out pieces of property. If he likes what he sees, often the Nature Conservancy will step in to preserve the land. The best way is just the old-fashioned way is to buy it. You buy a lock, stock, and barrel, and then take them and manage them. We manage about uh, over 1,000 preserves in the United States, ranging from over 100,000 acres to probably a quarter acre bat cave. We respond to opportunity, to, to a bargain sale, to a corporation calling and saying, um, We've got something here that doesn't really meet our needs, and for tax purposes, we'd love to talk to about like, giving you this or a bargain sale. And that's exactly what happened in the Big Bend area. The primary landowner is Procter & Gamble Cellulose, one of several large timber companies in northwest Florida. They own nearly a million acres in this part of the state, and they own uh, a number of very important natural areas. Including 60 miles of coastline they weren't using. It was exactly the kind of property the Nature Conservancy targets, one with diverse natural habitats, among them vast tidal marshes, stretches of hardwood forest, and especially seagrass beds. They are the principal reason the Nature Conservancy was interested in the property, that and the fact it houses an enormous variety of wildlife. A number of eagle nest, osprey nest. Uh, in addition, it's a uh, black bear habitat. Uh, uh, thousands and thousands of wading birds along the edge of the marsh. Uh, it is it's as wild an area as you could get in the uh, in Florida. So George Wilson started negotiating. It took nearly a year, but in the end, Procter & Gamble sold the property to the Nature Conservancy for the rock-bottom price of $20 million, $9 million less than it was worth. Six months later, the land was transferred to the state of Florida at cost, with the understanding it remained undeveloped. It's the largest project we've ever done east of Mississippi, and it's the largest property ever purchased by a state government east of Mississippi. It was hailed as an environmental coup. Even so, fellow conservationists sometimes criticize the group's ties to corporate America. But it's hard to fault their results. Since the Nature Conservancy started in 1951, they've acquired nearly five and a half million acres of land. And it's not always a corporation that's doing the selling. The elderly along uh, the coast of Florida here on the West Coast, sell their land to the, to the Nature Conservancy, so their land will be preserved as it was, so it will not be taken over by development. But of all the deals the Conservancy has been involved in, it was the Big Bend that made headlines and probably history. The reason is the property is sandwiched between other protected lands, both north and south, giving Florida a 200-mile coastline that will remain unspoiled. It may be just a tiny fraction of the land that makes up the state's seashore, but it's prime real estate. And if it hadn't been saved, it's quite possible that progress would have destroyed what ironically developers are calling Florida's last frontier. The Rudlows and other people who are trying to stop development are saying, hey, wait a minute. We can live here and leave it alone. We don't have to change it in order to enjoy it. It was time to make some changes aboard the Driftwood. Moss Kramer's stint was up, and he'd be leaving the boat. Do I look better? 
got to meet some fascinating people. Where do you turn to get back to? Oh, okay. Very good. It was a lot of those little things that made my trip down here very enjoyable. Moss was replaced by John Gloyeski from Indiana State University. And it was great that my first story, you know, I heard I was going to be diving with manatees. Uh, I personally had no idea what a manatee was. They're aquatic mammals, large ancient creatures that are related to the elephant. There are only 1,200 left in the United States, and one of the best places to find them is in Florida's Crystal River. We went out really early in the morning, like at 5 in the morning, so it was really foggy. And it was really a weird effect. You felt like you were in some, you know, horror movie going through the fog and uh, couldn't see more than five feet in front of us. Bill Page, our, our guide, seemed to know exactly where he was going. And exactly how to act around manatees so that they don't get hurt or scared. You can actually touch them. They feel rubbery and uh, they feel like a, a porpoise, I think, would feel. Um, and they're just huge. Huge is right. Manatees are as much as 15 feet long and can weigh 3,000 pounds. have been described as big Idaho potatoes with tails. And the areas in which they feed are a little murkier. So that was kind of fun because you, you couldn't see two feet in front of you. You swim along, and you just have to sort of follow your ears. You hear the crunching. It sounds like somebody eating lettuce. It was at that point that uh, Bill uh, introduced us to Dr. Jesse White. Yeah, we went over to check out a manatee that they said was injured over the Homosassa River two weeks ago. <laughs> and you could see a, a, a friendship there. The reason for it had been the manatee. Jesse White is a veterinarian. He became interested in manatees about a quarter of a century ago. I just rescued my first manatee in 1969, and this little critter was trapped in a storm drain over in Fort Lauderdale. And a big, he got off track in a big storm. And we called him Sewer Sam. Sewer Sam lived, as did a lot of other animals that Jesse White has rescued over the years. He claims the manatee is nature's only true, gentle creature. It has no fangs, no sh sharp claws, and they have no aggression in them whatsoever, even when mating. They have no predator nor prey. They're sort of like man in that they drink when they're not thirsty, have, they eat when they're not hungry, have sex out of season. They eat for about eight hours, and they sleep for about eight hours, and they play for about eight hours. And that's a pretty good life, if they're not stressed by man. But that's a pretty big if, yeah. because the manatees are in danger of being loved to death. By 11 o'clock, 12 o'clock, high noon, there were so many boats, they almost covered the water in, in certain areas. When we went over to the freshwater spring, you could have compared it with a, a parking lot. And unfortunately, many tourists go in without an experienced guide like Bill Page. And you could tell this by looking at these people, they had no idea what they were doing. They had no idea. They, you know, the only thing they cared about was getting in the water and looking at a manatee. No wonder the, the manatee would turn around and, and just hightail it right out of there, and they're being driven out of their natural habitat. And into waters that are too cold for them to survive. 
Those that stay in Crystal River run other risks, like run-ins with boats. I did not see a single manatee without a big scar on his back from a prop. Marks of man all over his back. Dr. White told us that that's not what kills most of them. Most of them he, that he finds washed up are from another source. And it could be pollution. It's just their habitat is being destroyed. One way or another, development is the culprit. It's altering the landscape, the character of this part of Florida, and the fate of much of its wildlife. Right now, the extinction of the manatee seems sort of inevitable, unless something is done really quick. And by really quick, I mean in the next few years. Eventually, Jesse White would like to see sanctuaries for the animals, so he's approached a local tourist attraction called Wiki Wachi to help him. They uh, have sort of underwater ballet where these women dress up as mermaids and swim around underwater and they have tails. It's not the reason Dr. White chose Wiki Wachi for his manatees, but there is a connection. I guess there's a, there's a myth that uh, Columbus came to the New World and saw a manatee think, and thought it was a mermaid. Of course, you have to be at sea a long time for these guys to be inviting, I would think. They're so ugly, they're beautiful. Yeah. But I can identify with that. The real reason sure. Wikiwachi appeals to Jesse is a river that runs through the property. The ideal thing would be to fence all the river and make this a preserve for the manatees. He wants to bring them in there as a sort of hospital sanctuary for the manatees, which have been hit by props from boats. Jesse White won't speculate on whether the manatee will survive, but he knows what it'll mean if they don't. They're sort of sitting up on the top of their food chain, so to speak, and it's a barometer of our environment's health. Uh, when the manatee goes away, as the top of the food chain, man's not far away. Jesse White told the Driftwood crew about a place they should see before they moved on, Rainbow Springs. He called it his Garden of Eden, and you know he said it would be the most beautiful spot in Florida. When we got up there, in my opinion, he was right. And probably the neatest part is the water. Uh, it's just crystal clear. All of a sudden, we just decided when we were done shooting, we were going to jump in that water. Just the epitome of refreshment right there. It was great. Driftwood headed south into another town whose life revolves around an animal. But unlike the manatee, the interest in this animal is purely commercial. We came into Tarpon Springs in the morning on Driftwood. You can see a lot of sponge boats. It's uh, an area that was originally settled by Greeks who came over from Greece um, for the sole purpose of sponging. I was the first generation born in Tarpon Springs or in America. But still, because my people were sponge people, this is what I learned. And learned well. Today, George Valeris owns one of the largest sponge businesses in town. He's been coming to know him as, as the godfather of Tarpon Springs. First thing that hits you when you walk in is the smell. Uh, the, the sponges are animals and they're decomposing. There's a couple of gentlemen clipping the, trimming them for aesthetic reasons. And there were bends all along the edge on either side. They sort by size in a very simple way. If the sponge fits in this hole and doesn't fit in this hole, then that means that's the size. And the whole operation is overseen by George. Are you basically shipping overseas, or do you also ship in the United we, States? Well, the United States is minimal. Mm -hmm. The best natural sponge in the world is produced in Tarpon Springs well, we for the commercial service. consumer. 
The biggest outlet for natural sponge is Europe. We're shipping with British Airways okay. to London, from London to uh, Cologne. Okay. I'm selling 90% of my sponge to Europe at this particular time. Not bad for the child of immigrants. George's grandfather was among the first group that came to Tarpon Springs at the turn of the century. The Greeks were sponge divers, and the reason to bring these people over was to expand the industry here in the United States. And it became a multi-million dollar industry in the uh, 30s to the 40s. George's father owned a sponge boat. So the first job I had was to go down below on the boat and clean the bilge. But 14 years old, I put on the first diving suit. I can remember it like it was yesterday. I felt real brave, real macho and everything, but as soon as they snapped the helmet on, I had second thoughts. That's because it was dangerous work and still is. The best sponges are found in deep water. And the currents off the, the coast of, of Tarpon Springs are not easy. Uh, the currents come in and they could have a, a forest that could just pick you up and, and carry you. It's so primitive still in a lot of ways. They still use the old aerator and the hose, and someone's watching the hose, holding it as, as they're going down underwater, constantly checking to make sure the air is passing through the hoses. Sponges grow on rocks and coral found on the ocean floor. A diver may be down there as long as six hours. But there's a reason people take the risk. Today, it's like a gold rush. The price of sponge is such that uh, it's a tremendous amount of money to be made out there. We have four lines, a hundred pieces, a small wool. Everybody got that? Go ahead. When the Driftwood crew was in Tarpon Springs, a single sponge was selling for as much as $10. But the price can change from week to week, depending entirely on demand. And these days, there's a huge market for the Tarpon Springs product, mainly because the world's other main supplier of natural sponges, the Mediterranean, has been hit by a blight. You are bidding on seven lines, 163 pieces. Tarpon Springs merchants experienced a similar blight here in the 1940s and 50s. The industry was virtually wiped out. The town survived by selling the only other thing it had that people wanted, its Greek heritage. The main street, the main drag, is very touristy. They want to go to um, a Greek shop and buy uh, whatever kind of Greek paraphernalia they can buy. Do not miss this trip while you're in the area. This is what Tarpon Springs is all about. And they want to see how the sponge divers did it in the old days. George owns one of the companies that offers sponge boat tours. It's a part of their life, and I, they, I think they've accepted that fact, and they coexist with the tourists very well. Now, these divers, the way that he controls his own ascending and but there are sections of town that are pretty much off limits to tourists. Now, the beautiful part about Tarpon Springs is that you are in two countries, really. I mean, I could be here in Greek town or in Greece, and uh, less than a mile away, I'm right back in the United States again. And in a sense, that's what the whole state is like, two separate countries. In the Northwest, there's old Florida, deserted beaches, a slower pace, fewer people. But the driftwood was heading into the other Florida, the tourist mecca, places like St. Petersburg, Longboat Key, and Clearwater. 
Each year, nearly 40 million visitors hit the Sunshine State. And it's not only tourists that are crowding the area. Florida is the fastest growing state in the country. A thousand people move here every day. It used to be that more newcomers settled along the East Coast, from Miami to Palm Beach. But now, as many people leave the Rust Belt to work or retire in the Sun Belt, Central Florida is growing rapidly as well, including the city of Tampa. All those additional people mean a greater demand for consumer goods and construction materials, which means more business for the port of Tampa. And you'll see one area where they'll be unloading or loading a, a certain thing, maybe phosphates. You'll travel to the next one, and it's specifically banana docks. And it's not just the big commercial vessels that frequent the port. A lot of fishing boats operate out of here. Small pleasure craft use the facilities. So do cruise ships and others. So one of the most interesting ones we saw was a, a tall ship from Denmark. Beautiful, beautiful. We had the opportunity to uh, motor next to it as Buddy and his people brought the ship in. Buddy Wendell, that is. He's a tugboat captain, and a lot of big ships wouldn't make it into port without him. See, a ship is big and clumsy, and they need help once they get close to the dock to moor them. Stop down. It's a very slow and gradual process, pushing and pulling, maneuvering the ship out. If you do anything too quickly, you're going to swing it in and it's going to bash into the shore. You're talking about so much power. You hear the, these huge ropes, and you hear it as it's going through the loop. Each time it's pulled a little tighter and a little tighter. And I just kept thinking, man, if that rope snaps, we're gone. That's a very real fear because the ships that Buddy and the crew maneuver are often 10 times longer and hundreds of times heavier than the tug. Predictably, Buddy says the danger is the worst part of the job. The best part of tugging, a pretty day, a nice job. Get to see the sun rise, sunset. You know, just being out on the water. And Buddy says the job suits him. Even the odd schedule, like working a 72-hour shift. They eat, live, sleep on the boat. The more you eat, the more you pay. It's amazing. And even the fact like that he may get job. called out 2, 3 in the morning to bring in a boat, that doesn't sway him at all. You're well paid. It's not a job of which is glamorized or, or thought highly of. And you know, you don't think when you're 12 years old, boy, I want to be a towboat driver. I want to be a captain of, uh, of one of them uh, tugboats. So why does Buddy do it? Because I like to eat regular. Steady job. One of the neatest things about this trip, I guess, is when er any time I've been to Florida before this, it was by car. So it's been a really neat experience for me to be traveling on the driftwood by water and coming into an area by water. You get a whole different feel. For me, you know, being on driftwood is a neat experience. It would have been described to me before I was there that it was like a floating apartment. And it is, and there's a lot of creature comforts of home, but sailing is a lot different. And so it happens we met a couple by the name of Bob and Lois who um, have retired, moved to Sarasota, and are spending their recreational time traveling Florida by sailboat. Bob and Lois Shulman are originally from Chicago. In a way, they are typical retirees. They moved to Florida. The state is the most popular retirement spot in the nation. But while many people spend their leisure years in RVs and on golf courses, the Shulmans would rather be sailing. They spend much of their time aboard their 34-foot boat, named after their daughter, Wendy. Everybody asks where we're going as if that was the destination. Somebody once said, you've arrived at your destination when you get on the boat and leave the dock. Beyond that, the destinations aren't all that important. It's the cruising itself. What can we do without the engine? I think we're sailing.
They're a perfect team. I can spank this up. Maybe a little old fashioned. Bob's the captain and Lois cooks. But they like it that way and they're happy that way. We both adore the water. We love all these wonderful places you can go to only by water. We anchor out in, in places like Little Shark River where you feel like no one's ever been here before. And you brought us in safety. We survived. We survived. In the 14 years since they moved to Florida, the Shulmans have seen a lot of changes, many of them bad. There's a heck of a lot more construction and uh, traffic on the roads and so forth. All the things that we wanted to get away from are following us. As the Driftwood crew headed south along the coast of Florida, past fast-growing areas like Fort Myers and Naples, they saw just the kind of thing Bob Shulman was talking about. Places that used to look like this. The stories they tell around here usually have something to do with pirates and cannibals, particularly on a small island 100 miles off the Florida mainland. Spanish explorers who arrived there in the mid-18th century claimed to find piles of human skeletons. They named the place Calla Hueso, Island of Bones. Today, it is called Key West. I really wanted to go to Key West just to say, oh, you're in the, the southernmost part of the United States. When you think of Key West, you conjure up images of Jimmy Buffett and slow, warm nights and drinking pina coladas and watching that sunset go down. Maybe that's what has drawn so many artists. Key West got its reputation as an author's haven after Ernest Hemingway and Tennessee Williams spent time here. Their homes have become popular tourist attractions. I would have loved to have been in Key West probably about 75 years ago because there, there still are and they've been preserved are the beautiful old houses and beautiful old neighborhoods. You just feel like you're almost in a different country. But since the days of Hemingway, Key West has gone through some drastic changes. Uh, Key West presents an ironic situation. The people who moved down there several generations ago did so to get away from it all. It's become commercialized, and it's just been, it's been spoiled. One person who watched the island change over the years is Dink Bruce. He's a fifth generation conch. A conch is a shellfish, popular to the region, known for inching along the bottom of the sea. And that's why they call the island natives conchs. You see, they're not known for a fast paced way of life. We see this guy traveling down the, down the street in this old army jeep. I really didn't know any Key West people yet, but he just looked like he belonged in this area. This is Dink Bruce's territory. Dink knows most of the people in town, all the other conks, as well as the artsy folks, painters, poets, novelists, and actors who spend a few weeks or months down here every year. But fame doesn't really impress Dink. He's used to being around it. When he was growing up, one of his father's close friends was Hemingway himself. Ernest had bought a house here in Key West and needed work done down here, so my dad was hired to drive down and, and start repairs. And that uh, experience and that friendship lasted until Ernest passed away in the 60s, and my dad was one of the pallbearers. He leads a lifestyle where his income um, is just enough to live on. That's all he really wants, just enough to live on. He's not looking for big wealth or anything like that. He builds cabinets, works in homes, or does whatever he needs. He dabbles in a lot of different things. He works on uh, homes and uh, is a carpenter. He does silk prints on shirts. Uh, he's working presently on putting together a cartoon on a, on a sort of a, a conch character. The Bubba Conk came out of a period of frustration. I read the Hemingway story and uh, uh, have and have not. And he, in the story, stated that the island was the conks were going to be starved out and, and uh, the shacks were going to be burned down and um, they were going to make this into a tourist town. So Bubba evolved out of a frustration or just the dilemma of a, of a critter who's now endangered. Hemingway saw it coming and Dink has spent his life watching it happen. Tourism has turned what was once a conch's paradise into a concrete carnival. 
In 1938, just before Hemingway packed up and left, Key West was only accessible by boat or plane. But then a highway was built, linking the Keys to the Florida mainland. Each year, more and more people come to the island, and as popularity grows, so does the cost of living. Dink fears someday he won't be able to live there anymore. One of his big concerns is just the growing prices of, of land in Key West and uh, how even his property taxes have skyrocketed. The food costs are greater here. Gasoline costs are greater here. And the tourists are going to pay. And the locals have to suffer or pay. If you were to put yourself in Dink's uh, place, you would be very pleased with it. You would be disgruntled, and you would probably want everyone to just leave and go away and go back to the, the charm which Key West originally had. But Dink realizes the chances are slim the island will ever return to the sleepy little fishing village that Ernest Hemingway knew. There's still the water. There's still being able to escape, to go out on the water and get away from the community. But that community could be spilling into the water that surrounds Dink's Island. Biologists believe sewage from the Keys is killing off marine life. The pollution may be coming from as many as 5,000 illegal cesspools, some of them built at the water's edge. It's not just the ocean that's in trouble. Many environmentalists fear Florida's fresh water supply is being sucked dry by development and growth. The tragic thing is, water is one of Florida's main attractions, and there's nobody who loves the water more than Mario Bustamante. He lives in Miami, and like Dink, finds refuge out on the Atlantic. He's quite the sailor, taking first place in some of America's toughest races. Uh, my father was an avid sailor, and he was uh, a very famous uh, racing sailor. And one day, he decided to go out in a race with uh, me and my brother. My, I was four, almost five. My brother was three, almost four. And uh, it, it got a little rough out there, and it scared the pants off of me, and I'll never forget it. And I've, I've been sailing ever since and loved every time I'm on the water. So much so, in fact, that he spread his love to others, others who share a similar passion for sailing. Your little light. You see, back in 1985, he heard the U.S. Olympic sailing team was looking for a training site, and Mario knew just the place. He was like, why don't we bring the sailing center here to Miami? And basically, Miami is now regarded as the single most important training facility. Everywhere else, uh, either it's in, the, in the winter it's too cold, or in the summer there's no wind. So it's, it's, it's done a lot of, for the Olympic Committee, and uh, we're very, I'm proud of that. He is also proud of his Cuban heritage. He was born in Havana and lived there until he was about 10. His family fled for the same reason thousands of others did, to escape Fidel Castro. Generally speaking, the earlier groups were better off and were better prepared to deal with, uh, with a move uh, like this. Uh, after the Bay of Pigs, the immigration was more middle class. And finally, uh, you have all kinds. I think the, the Cubans that have come over to Miami have brought a certain amount of culture to South Florida. They've made Miami a, a big city. They've created industries other than tourism for Miami. Um, they've basically built Miami into a very bicultural area. And Mario Bustamante is a big part of that. His wife, Angie, also fled Cuba when she was a little girl. She and Mario met in Miami when they were kids. Well, we were high school sweethearts. His school played at our gym. Just, you know, regular cheerleading type high school stuff. The Bustamantes live right on the water, only a few steps from the living room to their boat. But Mario is only out on the bay when he has some free time. His business is real estate. Mario builds housing developments in Dade County, just south of Miami. We've delivered 140 houses already, and we're starting site development on 220 more lots. And uh, we've got an eight-acre shopping center that we're starting uh, 
to build. Development is big business in Miami. It's big business all over Florida. People like Mario see the real estate boom as progress. But progress has a price, and environmentalists say the price is Florida's water supply. Florida's in a state of conflict right now because more and more people want to move here, and yet there is quickly running out of resources to accommodate these numbers of people. Ecologists say there's not enough water to go around, and money-thirsty developers are leaving the land bone dry. And the demand for housing is so strong that development is spilling out of urban areas into Florida's farmland. Mario's property used to belong to a farmer who grew potatoes and beans. It's a constant battle between the conservationists and, and the people who want to develop the land. The area that we're at is not a very controversial area. It's in the west part of the county that is the, the, where the controversy is. That's where uh, the developers are starting to get into wetlands and they're starting to interfere with the Everglades. And that's where the preservationists and the developers are really having a war. It's truly a life and death situation. As the driftwood crew headed toward the Everglades, they saw what man's unquenchable thirst mixed with development has done to nature. The Everglades, over 3,500 square miles, more than two million acres of underwater sawgrass prairies. One of the largest wetland systems in the world being choked dry by farmers, developers, and pollution. Not far from Miami, the crew found a person who may know more about the Everglades than anyone else. A hundred-year-old woman named Marjorie Stoneman Douglas. Never heard of him. She's dedicated her life to saving the ecosystem. On the outside, she may look like a fragile woman, but boy, you could stop and talk to her for 15, 20 minutes, and she's still got a lot left in her. I've seen a great deal of change in Miami. When I first came down here in 1915, there weren't 5,000 people in the city. And I've seen it grow in all this time. The reason she came to Florida was to get a divorce. Today, she still lives in a little thatched cottage built for her back in 1926. In the 20s, she worked as an assistant editor for the Miami Herald. Her father was the editor of the paper. I worked three years, and then, as I say, I went overseas. And then when I came back, I became a freelance writer, which I've been ever since. For 15 years, she sold articles to the Saturday Evening Post. But her most famous work is a book about the Everglades. And we used to go out to the end of the Tamiami Trail, where it stopped at the Dade County line. You could see the whole Everglades spread out ahead of you. And we'd go out and before breakfast and have fires in the road and cook our breakfast and see the birds and all that. It was just lovely. I was so fortunate to find a place that was so interesting that it had not been written about. Instead of trying to rewrite stuff, you're discovering it for yourself. And I was the one who discovered, established the fact that the Everglades were a river and not a swamp, not standing water. It was flowing water. It flows about four miles an hour. And so she called her book about the Everglades, River of Grass. Going into the Everglades with Marjorie Stone and Douglas was, was an honor and a privilege. It was like uh, entering the ocean with Jacques Cousteau or walking on the moon with Neil Armstrong. Tell me about, um... You're there exploring the Everglades with somebody who knows everything there is to know about it, as much as any human being can, and has fallen in love with it enough to devote her life to it. She foresaw the future uh, before anybody did, realizing that one day the Everglades are going to have to be saved. She has uh, spent a number of years, 60, 70 years of her life, dedicated to that cause. And it's a never-ending struggle. Marjorie Stoneman Douglas has fought to have the Everglades declared a national park. She's fought for legislation halting the draining of the Everglades. And she's still fighting developmental damage to the wetlands. Well, they cannot build in the Everglades because they're wet and they've got to be kept wet. If they allow them to dry up, then we'll all go and live somewhere else because it'll be a desert. 
Before people realized that the Everglades is in fact a river, they thought it was an enormous, worthless piece of swampland. Too wet to build on, too wet to farm on. So about a century ago, in an effort to make the Everglades an area fit for human habitation, developers and farmers started building canals, draining fresh water out of the muckland out to sea. We've been very much against the digging of canals. It drains the land, and the farmers want the land drained, but we have no business to have farming in the Everglades at all. But agriculture is one of the state's main industries. Florida farmers harvest nearly half the sugar cane in the country grow more oranges than any other place in the nation and raise more cattle than any state east of Texas. It's these farmers that environmentalists like Marjorie Stoneman Douglas are blaming for polluting Lake Okeechobee, the main source of freshwater for the Everglades. With Lake Okeechobee being the, the second largest lake in uh, the United States, it's hard to believe that there's going to be a water problem with it. Florida surrounded by salt water, but then you got a little bit of fresh water that runs down the middle through the aquifer and the streams and lakes and, and rivers that eventually lead to the Everglades that are the source for our drinking water. To really give you an idea, Lake Okeechobee is referred to a lot as the, the liquid heart of Florida, which is, is true in a lot of ways. One of those ways is fishing. It's one of the top places in the country for largemouth bass, and it's the speckled perch capital of the world. Every now and then you can find one that's a little braver than the rest of them out here meandering around. The supply is so great, no one's afraid of it being depleted. It weighs eight pounds, <laughs> at least. There he goes. What they are worried about is pollution. Since 1973, the lake has been closely monitored. In that time, researchers have found that phosphorus levels have doubled. And many say it's because of fertilizers from the sugarcane fields and manure runoff from the grazing lands. You know, it, it's funny because the cattle ranchers and all the farmers and all the sugarcane that's growing in around that area need that lake to help water their crops and, and water their cattle and things of that nature. And you would tend to believe the last thing they want to do is pollute the lake and make it unusable. Along the shores of Okeechobee, the crew came upon a cattle rancher who says he and his colleagues are getting a bum steer. Tommy Bronson has a 3,000-acre ranch on Lake Okeechobee and about 1,000 head of Brahmin cattle. It's all family-run. We don't... all run by the kids and grandkids and my wife, because she's the boss uh, <laughs> most of the time. I was raised on a cattle ranch. That's about the only thing I've... That's the only way to make a living that I've ever known. And my, my grandparents had cattle and my dad had cattle and we just, it's, and I just don't think there's any better way to live. Tommy Bronson works hard. He puts a lot into the land and he gets a lot out of it. He feels he makes an honest living and he takes offense when people tell him his ranch is destroying Lake Okeechobee. I feel that there may be other things polluting it more than what they're blaming agriculture for. There's a lot of people fish that lake. I'm, I'm talking about thousands of people. A certain amount of, of uh, oil that comes out of that motor. I don't see why that couldn't be a, a factor in uh, building of these subdivisions and uh, right along these waterways. It has got to be a factor. Uh, now, my cow polluting it? I, I'm sure she does. Uh, but so do the ducks on that lake. They gotta go to the bathroom too, you know, just like the cow. <laughs> and, uh, uh. But the Driftwood crew realized it wasn't so much a question of how the water got so dirty, but a question of how to make it clean again. What we should start realizing is that in order to, to keep our supply of fresh water in Lake Okeechobee and the Everglades, we've got to give some of it back untouched. Maybe put the demand for water on a, on a bit of a higher priority than it is now to be given back to nature instead of us using it all. That's what Marjorie Stoneman Douglas has dedicated most of her life to accomplishing. And at the age of 100, she's not about to give it up. <laughs> 
She's driving on Ford and moving up north to Lake Okeechobee, and she's going to work to save that area. Um, and she'll do it. If anyone can, she's going to be the one to do it. Do you feel a sense of accomplishment for uh, your century of work? Well, of course. I mean, we've been able to make progress at any rate. We've got a lot more to do. Do you think it will get done? Jerry, I am trying very hard, and if it doesn't get done, it won't be for lack of trying on my part. Well, so I don't right. know. I can't tell the future anymore, and you can. <laughs> okay. Oh, it's really pretty. They have, um... Perhaps Marjorie Stoneman Douglas is a symbol of Florida itself, a resource that should not be taken lightly. Traveling uh, the waterways of Florida, we've gone from huge barrier dunes up around Apalachicola, Big Bend area, to uh, the Everglades and uh, down to Key West and on up to Miami. And the one thing that they're that they are being faced with right now is is land is disappearing with a blink of an eye. I mean, you think of anywhere in the United States, you think oh, I'm going to go somewhere to retire. But a lot of people think of Florida. It's ironic. I mean, it's got so much to offer to so many people, but and people are taking advantage of that, maybe too much so. I grew up on the east coast of Florida, and I saw the beaches I saw were all covered with condominiums and, and were all built up and polluted and everything else, and that's what I was used to. So what this trip did for me, traveling along the west coast of Florida, was it it opened my eyes as to what's still left. I saw how beautiful beaches of Florida can be. I saw um, a manatee, things that have yet to be destroyed. And what we need to do now is to, to save it. In the weeks ahead, join the crew of the Driftwood as they travel more than 25,000 miles and rediscover the stories along the waterways that link the people of North America with one another and the rest of the world. Come along as they explore man's relationship with the water he treasures and despoils, plays with and fights with, and cannot live without. Join these young people on the next leg of On the Waterways. Funding for this program was provided by the Bamana Corporation of Fort Wayne, Indiana.